Good morning. Thank you for joining us again with Armanino for our year-end accounting, planning, and preparation webinar. My name is Mary Tressel, and I'm going to introduce our presenters to you and share with you how to work through this webinar. The first question I've been asked, are there presentation slides? And everybody who is registered for the webinar will receive a copy of the slides at the end of the webinar. But first of all, I want to let you know how to use your webinar pane. So you'll see in the upper right-hand corner a small orange arrow. You can click on that arrow to minimize or maximize your webinar pane. Also want to make sure that you're getting the best audio quality. So if you have called into the webinar, make sure that you uh, click that little icon that says switch to a phone call. Or if you're listening through your computer, make sure you click the computer audio. We do want to make sure you can hear this and not have an echo effect. And then to qualify for CPE, you must be using your personal computer and log in with your own information and the unique URL that was provided for you. You need to be logged into our online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of this webinar. You need to actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions and complete the evaluation survey that you will be emailed at the end of the webinar. And our presenters today, we have Jen McCabe. She's a partner leading our outsource finance and accounting team. Jen has more than 25 years of outsource accounting and finance and HR experience with a particular expertise in startups and the advertising and creative production industries. Scott Schwartz is our partner for CFO advisory services, and he helps privately held pre-IPO and public companies handle a wide array of complex transactions, including equity compensation challenges, business valuation needs, and technical accounting issues. And Isaac Peace is a senior manager in our audit practice, and Isaac works with a variety of technology, real estate, and financial services companies, providing financial statement audits and reviews, SEC and regulatory reporting compliance services, and technical accounting support. And with that, we're going to review our learning objectives here. So today, you're going to be able to recognize legal changes in employee classification that could affect your business. You'll be able to identify filing deadlines and areas to improve internal controls and compliance. We are going to highlight for you some best practices for policies and procedures documentation. And we're going to help you analyze the impact of recently issued FASB ASUs on both private and public companies. Okay, and we're going to start with year-end compliance. So take it away, Jen. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everybody. It's my job to warm up the audience and make sure you have a few easy CPE questions. So I hope that you signed in on time. I'm going to cover some things that I think are pretty normal for most people. I'm hoping that I can give you a few tricks and tips for the end of the year. The most important thing that you're doing, of course, is trying to finalize your accounting and report to shareholders or owners. And what I also like to tell people is that they need to be thinking ahead a couple years for when they can't remember every transaction that happened in 2019 and somebody gets audited or there's a reason to look back. So the most important thing is to look at balance sheets and look at accounting work papers for each of those balance sheet items and make sure there's a work paper. And if you're a senior person and you've been a little lazy about reviewing your staff work papers, be sure you look at it now. The tricky stuff is when you're doing tax, especially you see that somebody has a lot of assets on their balance sheet that are actually obsolete or should be disposed of. And as an operating matter, you wanna get them off of that sheet because you don't wanna be insuring them. So look around the building, make sure that your fixed assets actually reflect what people are sitting on or using for work. Get rid of AR, think about just giving up the ghost on things that you aren't gonna collect. Look at bank recs. Again, this is something that staff people do and they get in a habit and they don't actually look at the stale dated checks as a to-do list, as something to get rid of. It's time to clean that up and uh, Scott's on the phone because he knows that you have to get your cap table right. We'll talk about that. You don't wanna to report to shareholders anything that is reflective of a cap table that's incorrect. So that's something to really focus on. Yep, uh, yeah, no, yes. I think man, that's, that's right. And we'll, we'll kind of talk more about some 
uh, some ways to get there, but I think it's just all about uh, doing some reconciliations uh, through through the various systems, right? Cross checking payroll to uh, to maybe your equity administration system. Did did all the exercises get captured? Uh, terminations, etc. Just making sure that um, those eyes those items tie out uh, is really important to getting that cap table right and uh, and being sure that. To Jen's point, if you're providing it to uh, to investors, to the board, to management, whomever, um, that it's that it's accurate. So uh, you know, now is the time to start. Kind of December, I think, is the time to really start to to do some of those reconciliation processes. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later as well. Yep, it can be embarrassing to have someone on the cap table who's no longer with the company. Um, revenue recognition is something we're also going to cover later, but. It's time to look back and make sure you've documented, not just done revenue recognition correctly, but documented your process and your policy. And then think about 2020 and make sure you've got it right for that year coming as well. It's You're right at that pivot point. Leases should be capitalized. Everybody knows it, but check your P&L and look and see if there's something that's called uh, rental of equipment or even lease expense. We still see it sometimes. Get rid of it. It's an obvious uh, thing for, that an auditor would notice. One of my favorites is reconciling payroll returns to wages before the end of the year. This is a really important thing to do because you probably know that if you get someone's W-2 wrong and they bring it to you, they're likely to do that in March or April. And sometimes they do it in September or October. And you want to beat them to the punch because reconciling one W-2 and changing all of your W-2s and W-3 payroll returns is a giant hassle. So we like to recommend that people prepare a salary grid and just list everybody's gross salary and then make sure quickly in January that it matches with your W-3 and your 940s because the common mistakes that we see are that a payroll processor will fail to take account for a check that was canceled. A payroll check gets canceled, but the W-2 still shows it. Or a bonus is processed manually and the payroll processor didn't get it in the mix. And this happens with the big payroll processors. We catch them doing it every year on our clients. So take a look at that. And then if you are a CFO controller who helps shareholders and stakeholders with their taxes. It's not just paying the estimated taxes for your entity, but make sure you're supporting the owner of the company and paying estimated tax. And if you wanna win some brownie points, make sure that you're talking to their tax person about the 199A strategy that they might be able to employ if there's a pass-through entity. There's such a giant tax advantage to that new rule that you want to make sure that you're talking to your owner or your shareholders about taking advantage of it and helping them pay their taxes on time. It can make you look like a star. All right, next slide. I'm going to hit this last payroll slide again because it's such a lot of work if it gets wrong. So check employee pay stubs, make sure that their addresses are updated. If you're using an HRIS, they should have updated it themselves, but don't assume anything. Make sure that you have documentation for social security numbers so you don't get nasty letters later. It's not good to get hate mail from the IRS. Um, Year-end bonuses are an interesting thing for us. They cause a lot of questions. So if you have salespeople in particular, Know if you're accruing or paying it. Be ready for those questions where people ask you inevitably, is my bonus included or not? The one that I got on January 5th should have been included. Make sure you're ready. Again, shareholder payrolls are a big thing right now. If you have an S Corp and you're paying the shareholder health insurance premiums through the company, those health insurance premiums need to be run through the owner's W-2. And a lot of people forget to do that. So go back, look at the number that is the shareholder health insurance premium. And remember, you might pay one on December 28th and include it in the W-2, send it to your payroll processor so that it's correctly accounted for. Retirement plans, it's time to sit down and budget for that. Are you gonna match? Are you gonna accrue? Have you maximized the owner and shareholder contributions? 
um, it's time to have a meeting with the tax CPA, make sure that they're thinking ahead. Um, the other thing to think about, and it, for shareholders, it's an issue, but it's also for employees, time for you to look at other comp. We've run into cryptocurrency payments. They have to be run through W-2s and people forget about it until later. Automobile stipends need to be run through W-2s. And this year, the hot items, which I didn't put on this slide, but I want to make sure everybody's listening, you have to run employee parking through their W-2. And the other thing that's coming up is if you have salespeople or executives who have fancy trips or you have fun retreats that are a little more fun than business, technically you're supposed to add that to the W-2 as well. Obviously you want to have a business agenda on these boondoggle trips, folks. But <laughs> if you don't have a business agenda, be ready to put it on the W-2. And if folks are taking their spouses on these trips, that's been coming up. We've seen that. So put your hairy eyeballs on that W-2 stuff. The last thing on this let is- me, uh, Hey, Jen, let me jump in there as well. I mean, I think the other, the other piece that we see a lot of uh, clients missing or forgetting is- is uh, on the equity compensation side as well, right? And that's a that's a piece of other comp. Um, and it could be W two, it could be ten ninety nine. If you have uh, consultants or advisors uh, or even board members uh, that do get uh, equity awards and uh, exercise, um, or or if you have restricted stock units, uh, restricted stock awards, and there is a uh, a vesting, uh, those are all taxable events. Hopefully. Uh, you've withheld if they're non-qualified stock options that got exercised or any of those restricted awards that vested. Hopefully you withheld during the period um, and, and that was the proper thing. If you didn't withhold, then you probably need to go back and figure that out. Um, but even if you did withhold, then it's making sure does that making sure that comp shows up uh, on the W-2 as well. Um, we'll talk about the ISO exercises in a little bit and some of the tax reporting around that, but we are unfortunately still seeing um, clients that are missing that non-qual portion. Uh, either they didn't withhold or they didn't put on the W-2. Um, the other thing is around uh, the $100,000 limit related to incentive stock options. Um, Again, don't want to get too much in the weeds, but you know, if, if you have somebody who exercises uh, a combination of an award that is an ISO or an incentive stock option and a non-qualified stock option, again, you have to treat the non-qualified portion uh, as taxable, um, and that should all be on the W-2. So you want to make sure you look back through that. Um, you run maybe an exercise report out of your system, um, or obviously, hopefully, it's already in payroll. But those are some of the things as we talk about kind of year-end reconciliations and we have a slide on kind of some of the areas we recommend doing sort of a mini audit um, but that's one of the areas i want to make sure when we talk about before the last payroll uh, we want to make sure we get that stuff on there yep and those of you who are listening if this is making you put this on your to-do list if you work with scott and i on this what we do is work with your payroll people and we help scott and you figure out what needs to be withheld and we get that in your payroll run before the end of the year so by using his brains and my brawn you can get that figured out <laughs> and well and, and i think uh well said jen i think the other piece of it is getting it done in 19 right is just uh -huh. the, 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 the benefit and the value and the timing rather than trying to correct it when we get to 2020. Like don't underestimate the challenge of, of correcting things or having to issue revised W-2s. Those, that's a, it's a pain in the butt. Yep, very much so. And your payroll processing companies fight you on it. They don't like doing it and they'll charge you a lot of money and still not do it very quickly. Um, my last thing on my list is PTO accruals, which many accounting people just hate doing. It's usually a big number. And 
when you're closing the office, it's time to sit down with your HR people and go, okay, if we're closing the office between Christmas and New Year's or extra days off, when people have excess PTO, we've given them lots of opportunities to take time off, do we want to tell them that they have to use their PTO so that it reduces our accrual? These are tricky HR related discussions, but think about it right now because it can have a large financial impact if you come up with a policy that's fair and you publish it this week. I'd get on that. All right, the next slide is everybody's favorite, mine especially. The, um, the rules on 1099 contractors have gotten worse since 2010 every single year. The most important message here is that if you're listening and you're a CPA and you think that you understand how to classify workers, you need to think again because even I, who do this every day, run into tricky situations and every single case is its unique case. I wish there was a, a better way to say it. The court though, meanwhile, has legislated this now. It's a law in California and many states that you classify workers as staff unless they satisfy very stringent tests. There are exceptions in California to this based on who has the most legislative muscle, really. People who are tricky with legislation and lobbyists are making headway. Most of us don't have that. If you're a doctor or a lawyer, you might be exempt. But generally speaking, if you are paying someone, at, you've got to put them on payroll unless they have their own business and they have a federal ID number and they have their own staff and they have all the things that make them look like a business owner. They also need to be doing work that isn't in the normal course of your business. So if we at Armanino run an accounting firm and Scott and Isaac walk in and they're doing some electrical work, I can probably put them on a 1099 because they'd be licensed as electricians, not as accountants. But if they come in to do accounting work, even though accountants can be exempt, they might not be exempt if they're working on my clients under my direction. So I always put the C test first because it's the easy one. Do they have their own business? If they don't, you just immediately put them on temporary payroll and don't screw around with it because we're handling a lot of audits with the EDD. Last year I did 21 myself and the fines and penalties are very expensive and it actually makes it cheaper now to put people on payroll. And that goes for interns, that goes for folks who work for you for a very short period of time. Materiality does come into play. And if you wanna talk about it or think through it, you need to do some math usually, okay? So we'll look out in 2020, they're gonna be even meaner. And when they audit, they're looking back at your 1099s for the past three years, even though this became a law in September. There's enough rulings on this matter that they have no problems looking back three years. So gear up for 2020 and make sure you square it. I would send a memo out to anyone who you think you should change from a 1099 contractor to a temporary employee. I would send a memo out telling them about their change in status. Now we can help you pen those memos. And I would also make sure that you Finish paying them on a 1099 and cut that off on December 31st and make sure every penny next year is put through payroll so that you are giving them a 1099 this year and a W-2 next year and you're not giving them both a 1099 and a W-2 in any single tax reporting year, tax filing year, okay? Uh, let's hit the polling question. Just one moment. Okay, I'm gonna read through this for the audience. So if I pay Scott a fee to provide a service to me, which of the following will allow Scott to be treated as an independent contractor? A, Scott only works for me two hours a week remotely. B, he owns and operates an independent business with his own staff. C, he does work outside the normal course of my business. Or D, both B and C. So we're going to give you another few seconds to uh, to weigh in. I don't in. remember signing up to be uh, to mm -hmm. to be the Ponzi in this uh, in this polling question. By the way, 
I think you're the electrician in this scenario. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Fair enough. Actually, you just work for free for me, Scott, anytime I need to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are gonna um we're gonna close that poll. So get in your votes. And then we will give you the correct answer. And okay, the good. correct answer. Smart people. How'd they do, Jen? That was good. 82% is great. People are learning this. I'm so happy. Uh, most often the question that we get is that, well, what do I do with someone who only works for me for a couple hours? And here in Los Angeles, where we have production companies, if someone shows up on set for two to three hours, you still have to put them on payroll. There are all sorts of things to think about. Of course, if it's immaterial, guys, you know, I'm not going to put it in writing, but you, you might be able to wiggle. But I would be very careful about wiggling. All right, let's go I to the next. On to our next slide. And that is um, this is just awful this slide i'm gonna so we're gonna send it out to everybody i think the only point to make here is that we can't assume that all 1095s are due the same time and all the 1099s are not due on the same dates anymore the rules generally are the same and generally speaking if you file electronically you get a little more time they're encouraging us and Generally speaking, the penalties for filing late are horrible. And you can apply for an extension, but it's not automatic. You absolutely have to apply for an extension if you need one for these forms. And you need to be very careful about filing late. Okay, so don't assume yeah, I think the key thing you. there. Yeah, the key thing there is always to be proactive in filing that extension, right? It's, it's, it's better if you think you're not gonna be able to meet that deadline or whatever it is, right? Uh, if you want to avoid penalties and it, it's, not, it's not absolute, right? Filing extension isn't just a, a get out of jail free card, but just making sure you do that early um, and ahead of time rather than kind of after the fact. So. Yep, yeah. Uh, let's jump to the next slide. Um, one of the other items, um, and again, this is, uh, again, kind of to the forms and some of the, the year-end compliance uh, items to, to think about is around disqualifying dispositions. Um, so we were talking about uh, incentive stock options and non-qualified stock options earlier. Um, and incentive stock options, right, when I exercise, they're only taxed for, for AMT purposes, for alternative minimum tax purposes. And then you file the 3921s and 3922s, and we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Um, but when somebody sells, so um, a common thing that people are doing these days are secondary transactions. Um, and again, depending on how that's structured, but if somebody had held ISO shares, meaning they exercised last year and they're selling uh, in a secondary this year, right, that would be a disqualifying disposition. Um, and that needs to be reported on the W-2. Um, so if somebody sells uh, within two years of grant or one year of the exercise, um, it, it's, it's an or thing, um, or sorry, it's an and thing, uh, meaning that they have to hold it two years from grant and one year from exercise. Um, so if I get a grant on January 1st of 2018, right, and I exercise on January 1st, 2019, I'd have to hold that till January 2nd, 2020 to have a qualifying disposition. If I sell before then, that would be considered a disqualifying disposition. Um, with private companies, it's typically a little easier because you know, you know, because your stock isn't liquid, you know when people are selling. Uh, for public companies, a little bit harder and, and you should be doing these surveys. Again, I'd recommend doing them now um, and basically asking people, hey, have you sold any shares, ISO shares? Again, recommend putting in the date of the, the ISO shares were exercised because you should have that tracked, et cetera. Um, but that's, uh, that's something where we go back to that payroll piece. That's something you got to make sure gets on the W-2 if they did have a disqualifying disposition. Similarly, um, again, for our public clients, the employee stock purchase plan, disqualifying dispositions. So same thing, if it's one year after the purchase date uh, and two years after the grant date, so that, that same 
uh, rule applies, um, then it's a qualifying disposition. But if they sell those shares within that period, that's a disqualifying disposition and needs to be reported on the W-2. Um, so little uh, nuance there. And it's, again, as a public company, it's a little harder to track these things. Um, so that's why you do the survey. Uh, and it, it all comes back to kind of to what Jen was talking about. It all comes back to risk. Um, the survey is a nice way to say, if the IRS comes back, hey, we surveyed people, we tried to get this information, uh, you know, and, and that, that kind of is gets you a little bit off the hook. Uh, I think, again, if you're a private company and you're doing secondary transactions at all, um, maybe they were taxed as part of the transaction, but if somebody held ISO shares, then that's something you want to make sure you report. So let's, uh, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and jump to the next, uh, the next slide. This is again an easy to do list, which we'll include for you guys. The 1099 filing readiness is also something to do now. Run that report, make sure that you've got W9s for all vendors so that you can show that you did get that and you had it on time. And if people are reluctant to provide you with their social security number, you know what that means. You need to tell them they have to give it to you, period, end of story. Um, we like to also get everybody on their non-income tax compliance and get everything in one folder that has to do with business tax, resale certificates. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on with sales tax and Wayfair. So when you get a sales tax audit or a business license audit, they go straight to your income tax returns and you want this stuff all together. It's a good habit to do that. Um, in terms of HR stuff, People forget that sales incentive plans for salespersons are fringe benefit plans, just like a medical plan is, and you want to renew them. They need to have an end date, so work with your HR team. You have to report to folks who have sales incentives and provide them with documentation of what they've earned or not earned. And of course, it's time to update handbooks. It's time to make sure that you are planning for training if you have to do uh, sexual harassment prevention training next year, get it done, get it out of the way now. Next yeah, slide. I think, Jen, yeah, uh, I think um, I was gonna add two things that actually uh, aren't on the list, but I think on the sexual harassment training, um, you know, I think that is a big one, especially for, you know, for uh, California companies, right? There's, there's some big regulations around that. But uh, two other items I was gonna add to the other compliance, a uh, 409A valuation, right? If, if you do your annual valuation at year end, hopefully that's already kind of part of your year end planning, but that's typically a compliance item. We see a lot of companies doing that at, with a 1231 uh, year end date. Mm -hmm. um, the thing to remember, right? Whether you do it 1231 or you do it another time, uh, typically, there's kind of a one-year sort of uh, uh, availability, right, or applicability for that. Um, unless you've had some sort of material milestone or material event, then then it would be a shorter period. Um, the other thing, uh, which isn't directly related to year-end, um, but another compliance item that uh, that we have clients thinking about is the qualified small business stock, um, which, again, yeah, we're not going to go in depth into it, but it is... Uh, what it allows for is a, if you qualify or if the people that sell stock qualify for qualified small business stock, um, they can basically eliminate $10 million, up to $10 million of capital gains. Um, so it's really powerful. You know, basically if, if you're able to hold the stock five years from when you acquired it and the company had met other criteria upon that uh, when you acquired it, the, the, ba the basic thing is being under 50 million in assets at the time of acquisition of the stock and then holding it for five years before you sell it. It's a little more complex than that, but that's kind of the basics. Um, so we do see clients kind of think about, okay, hey, as part of going into 2020, I want to have a, a QSBS, a qualified small business stock survey done or a study done um, so that especially if we're planning to do a secondary or some sort of liquidity in 2020, we have that uh, ready to go. So something else to think about. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on the penalties here. Um, I think the the big thing to note, and, and Jen, you can add, but is that the penalties are expensive. Um, and they're getting and, bigger every year. They went up this year. And yep. I, I, my rule of thumb is, if you're filing W-2s or 1099s late, 
if you have a thousand employees, it's going to cost you a million dollars. So if you have 2000 employees, it's going to cost you $2 million. If you file your W-2s a day late, that's no penalties and no interest. So if you file them on February 2nd, instead of January 31st, you could be liable for a lot. And they cap out at over $3 million. The 1099 penalties are getting very steep too. They're increasing them because 1099s are low hanging fruit for auditors. They're going after those misclassification of worker audits. They want to see those 1099s on time. Unemployment rates are low and the auditors at the EDD have nothing to do in terms of filing claims or helping people who are filing for unemployment. The only thing that's keeping them busy is audits. They are dying for you to send those 1099s in. Don't be late, okay? We'll send this slide out too and then let's move on. Yeah, let me just add real quick before we jump into the polling question on the, the 3921s and 3922s, right? Those are the uh, forms required related to if you had any incentive stock options that were exercised in the year. Um, mm. So it's a little bit, again, of a nuance. Uh, we see a number of companies that, you know, because they've had exercise activity, they're aware of it, um, but we still find clients just it's not even that new anymore. I think it was implemented in 2013 or 14 that the IRS put this into effect. Um, there's no, remember, there's no withholding upon the ISO exercise, but it doesn't mean you don't have to report it, right? You have a two reporting obligations. Um, one is to report to the employees uh, by uh, January 31st uh, and give them an information statement. Uh, and then to file with the IRS by, if you do electronic filing by 331, paper filing by 228. So those, um, again, are important pieces to make sure it's not something you're thinking about every day. It's not also going to be something that's in payroll. That's, that's, I think, the trickiest part, right? If you're populating W-2s and 1099s, you're pulling that information from payroll. An incentive stock option exercise isn't going to be in payroll Again, unless maybe it was a disqualifying disposition, uh, it's not going to be in payroll. It's going to come out of your equity system. Um, so again, if you need help filing those or understanding what you know what to do there, you know, let us know. Um, we, we, our our team is actually sending reminders to clients right now um, to help them on that. Uh, and and our team knows equity systems, so they can pull the data right out for you. Uh, and really, it's an easy transition. So let's go ahead and jump into that polling question. Right, so the polling question is, W-2 filing penalties can exceed $3 million. Is this true or is this false? So we've got a few of you voting. We'd like to see uh, the majority of you vote so we can get you that, that CPE credit. All right, it looks like we've got the majority of the group has voted, so we're going to close it. And we've got uh, the majority voting true. Jen or Scott, is that mm -hmm. correct? It is true that they are capping out at $3.2 million for large employers. So that's why we're trying to get everybody to file on time. That was a trick question, Jen. That was a trick question. 3.2 mm -hmm. million. Yeah, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, and, and again, I think these are just some areas where we uh, want to get 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 people thinking about. Um, we're not going to go into a ton of detail. We do have some slides that provide some great lists that we don't want to just read off of. But in thinking about kind of preparing for year end, um, there's a lot of the compliance stuff that Jen and I have talked about, and Isaac is going to cover some of the new accounting guidance. Um, but some of the other things to be thinking about is inventorying your policies. What do you have documented? What don't you have documented? Um, you know, I, I used to use the example if, you know, if Jen gets hit by a bus and, you know, she's no longer there, who knows what to do? I try and change that to be less morbid and say if Jen wins the lottery and she leaves us, do we know, you know, do we know what, what is going <laughs> to, is that person's going to fill in and do? Uh, infrastructure planning, what do you, what do you, what systems are you investing in next year? What, what does that look like, right? And starting to think about that. This is the time to, to do that. The year-end mini audit, and we'll talk about that in a couple slides um, 
I think that's really important. If you do get a full financial statement audit, even if you don't, I think it's best practice, but especially if you do have a full financial statement audit, doing a sort of a mini audit of your of your books, of your doing reconciliations, um, and so that's really important as you plan for uh, 2020. And, and maybe that, you know, maybe that mini audit, you know, bleeds into next year, that's fine. These are just a couple of the key procedures, not gonna go through this very detailed. These are a couple of the key procedures that um, we recommend, again, making sure that you have documented um, and that you're leveraging technology. Go ahead to the next and, slide. Start, start oh, something really quick. Sure. From a financial, a financial accounting and reporting standpoint, and year end audit standpoint, having these in place, you know, if they're documented, it can have a huge impact on the audit. And from the flow of risk assessment all the way down to the testing that's performed, um, oftentimes companies don't have good documentation in place. They may have great controls, but they don't have good documentation in place. And it can result in, in more audit time and, and delays in the process. Um, so the more that you can have these summarized and, and, and well documented and have an accurate inventory uh, of these policies, as, as Scott was, was talking through, you know, it can have a huge impact on, on your year-end audit. That's a great that's a great point, Isaac. Thank you. And uh, just some of the new guidance and, and, and Isaac's going to cover even some of the other items. These are the big ones. Um, they're all important to understand, but these are the big ones. Uh, I will tell you, we still have clients that haven't adopted 606, even though uh, for fiscal year starting, you know, basically January uh, after December 15th. But, you know, if you're a, if you're a calendar year end, it would have been FY19 that you would have to adopt 606. Um, again, that's important to get going. Uh, lease accounting, Isaac's gonna talk about, we had a little bit of a reprieve, um, so, so we'll talk about that. And there's a new um, equity accounting standard which actually is simplifying things um, for clients to basically treat non-employees like employees for uh, share-based compensation. Um, so it's a nice simplification. You do have to do a little bit of an analysis to uh, get it, um, get an entry run through, potentially run through retained earnings to kind of true it up. But it's nice. Uh, you no longer have to mark to market non-employees. So if you have them, you have to do an adjustment as of whatever adoption date you choose. Uh, but then if you had a new employee start uh, in March of 2020, uh, then that would that person would be treated from a like an employee for fair value purposes and for for accounting purposes uh, immediately. So let's go ahead and jump uh, to the next slide. Other kind of equity accounting related items that we we recommend. So again, potentially doing an analysis on on the non employee. Uh, classification would be something to to consider as part of the year-end process. Um, again, it might be a 2020 entry, a January 1st, 2020 entry, although we're seeing a lot of clients that are saying, hey, I want to adopt it 1-1-2019. So it's up to you. That, that would be an early adoption for private companies. Um, but if you want to do that, you can. Uh, but other items are around um, on the valuation side. You know, making sure that you get your projections uh, set up for the if you're doing a year-end valuation, making sure you have those aligned. Your peer group, um, making sure that that gets updated and reviewed. Um, and again, you want your peer group for your valuation, ideally, to be aligned with your peer group for your your equity compensation uh, valuation, the fair value on the on the SBC side, um, and the time to liquidity. You know, thinking about that, right? You know, last year we used three years. Are we still using three years this year? Maybe, um, but what does that, you know, what does that mean? Those are, I think, assumptions that are important. Um, for equity awards, for stock-based comp, uh, hopefully you're not still applying a forfeiture rate. Uh, there was guidance 2016-09, ASU 2016-09, that allowed you to get rid of the forfeiture rate. Um, so hopefully you're not applying that still. Um, and then these are some other assumptions, again, to look at from a year-end perspective, uh, but then also going into 2020, uh, what, are we, what are we doing? How are we categorizing these? And then if you do have any cash settled awards, uh, making sure obviously you mark those to market as part of year-end. Let's go ahead and jump to um, the next slide. Again, not going to go through this uh, line by line, but I think these are the, the key areas and Isaac, I think, can attest to this from, from an audit perspective. These are the key areas that I think is really important to uh, 
to trust and verify, right? Trust meaning that you trust what comes out of your system and you should, uh, but verifying these buckets and diving in, whether it's doing your own kind of sample quote unquote testing, or it's doing reconciliations and cross-checking systems. You know, a common one I, I may have mentioned earlier is comparing exercise information from your equity administration system to your payroll system. Uh, if again, if there's, if there's non-qualified stock options um, and things like that. So, do, so doing some reconciliation uh, and tying those things out uh, is, is really important as, as part of the year end process. Okay, and now we are on to our third polling question. And that question is, which accounting standard adoption will you focus on the most in 2020? Is it ASC 606 revenue recognition? Are you still trying to get up to speed on that? Um, ASC 842, the lease accounting standard, ASU 2018-07, the share-based compensation. Uh, the, the question, your answer might be, I don't know what any of these are, so I need some help, or none of the above. So we're looking to this just uh, find out where you're going to focus your energies uh, in 2020. And it looks like we've got a, a large amount of the group. We're going to let you go for just a couple minutes more, a couple seconds more, I should say. All right, we're going to go ahead and close that poll. And it looks pretty evenly split between revenue recognition and lease accounting. All That's right. awesome. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think those are the two big ones that makes that makes a ton of sense. So, um, yeah, Isaac, let's let's talk through uh, kind of some of the other standard updates. And, uh, you know, there might be more that people put on their put on their list for 2020, depending on what uh, what what of interest you tell them. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, I think the big, the big one out there is, is obviously revenue recognition. Is it, that's private companies or if your fiscal year calendar as Scott said should have been adopted you know, for this year. And, and if you're trying to catch up at this point, it's, it's a difficult process. It is something that we can help. We do have companies that are a little bit behind the game for whatever reason. Um, it is something that we can help with, but from just a, an accounting standards update, from a global perspective, uh, the FASB is kind of taking a, a deep breath and, and taking a step back and, and said, let's give private companies and, and smaller reporting public companies a break. Let's give them some additional time to work through issues and, and adopt new standards you know, in light of, of the huge change that the revenue recognition standard could potentially be on, on companies to the scope of, of the potential lease or the lease standard. Um, and there's some other ones out there that big one that's kind of coming after the lease standard is uh, the financial, uh, financial instruments and credit losses specifically. It's commonly known as, as CECL is the acronym. It stands for current expected credit loss. Uh, but the good news on, on all of these standards is that the FASB has, has pushed these back. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about each one of these in, in just a minute. Uh, but then outside of just the deferrals, there are a couple of other things that we do want to touch on briefly. And, and first is the expansion of private company rules on, on the recognition of the variable interest entity. Uh, this is very unpopular standard for a lot of private companies, and, and a lot of them have elected to uh, not comply with the standard and, and to take a, co a scope exception in their audit report, in their audit opinion, um, because they don't feel it adds value to users of the financial statements. The FASB has, has come out with some additional guidance on for private companies that, uh, that we'll touch on as well. And then the last one that's not outlined in the, in the slide or in the slide deck that I do want to mention is some additional guidance for nonprofit entities and specifically related to the accounting for goodwill um, in, in an acquisition. Previously, there, were, there was guidance issued to private companies that allowed them to not separately recognize goodwill or intangible assets related to uh, customer-specific items and non-compete non agreements. Private companies were then allowed to subsume those items into goodwill and not have to recognize them separately and, and have separate valuations done and, and keep separate reporting uh, for amortization and, and all that fun stuff that goes with it. Um, that, that guidance is now applicable for, for private, uh, for nonprofit entities. And additionally, then now pro nonprofits can also elect to amortize goodwill uh, over a period not to exceed 10 years. I mean, that's not covered in the standard, but if it's something you'd like to like to discuss with us, please let us know. Um, happy to happy to talk to any questions on that. Um, moving on to the next slide. This is our second to last polling question. So have you started the process of analyzing the impact of the new leasing standard on your organization? So yes, no, or I don't know. 
we're going to give everybody a chance to, to log their vote. Again, remember you need to answer three, uh, 75% of the polling questions, so if you've participated in the last four, you're good. If you missed one, you still have another polling question to, to respond to. And we are going to go ahead and uh, close that poll. So it sounds like the majority of the group uh, still needs to do that process to analyze the impact of the new leasing standard. Yeah, and this, this is not actually that, that surprising. This is a big part of the reason why the FASB has decided to defer the effective date of the standard. Um, They've seen a lot of the issues that public companies had to go through with the adoption of, of, of this guidance, and they're giving the, the private companies some additional time. But in terms of a global kind of viewpoint of the new standard, especially as as majority of the group hasn't yet started kind of digging into what's required, um, the big impact of the new lease standard is that private uh, the companies now have to recognize lease liabilities on the balance sheet. Um, there's going to be an offsetting corresponding right to use asset for operating lease agreements, um, but every, every lease has to be on the back. With the exception, there, there are a few things that are, that are scoped out, um, specific types of leases, leases for intangible assets, um, things that, that are non-regenerative, biological assets, if you're leasing inventory, um, if you're building assets that, that are being leased, um, and then anything with a term of less, less than 12 months, those are scoped out. Otherwise, leases have to come onto the balance sheet. Um, it also muddies the waters a little bit in going towards more of a of a principles-based standard than a, than a prescriptive standard in that you know, the bright lines for is this an operating lease versus a capital lease are now gone. Um, uses terms now like the majority of, so the majority of the economic use for life or the majority of or significant majority of the net present value of future payments. Um, and it's, it's, so it's up to companies to make an accounting policy election and determine you know what those thresholds are going to be internally. Um, this is in line more with with international standards. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how and what happens as companies adopt the standard. There are certain um, opportunities for, for some judgment that's going to go in by management on this. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Based on kind of what the public companies had to deal with, um, it, it's been a huge effort. There's been a lot of back and forth on what's happened and how things have gone from an implementation standpoint, but these are just some of the, the challenges that, that they've run into, both on the implementation side and on the post-implementation side. Um, as you start getting into it, you know, these are things to be aware of, but then the, the big thing that I would just really want to reinforce, as you're, as you're getting ready for this, is to just to communicate early. You know, talk with your board of directors, talk with your owners, talk with your bankers. Um, there's going to be impacts to the financial statements that they may not understand or may not expect. Uh, it's just important to get out ahead of this early. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, that's a good point, Isaac, is, is uh, coordinating with, with external stakeholders. I think sometimes people uh, kind of forget that, but that is there is going to be a change if you think about bank covenants and things like that. And those, those are all impacted by this, for sure. That's, that's the big one, is, is are those covenants, and you would assume that bankers are understanding the new standard, and, and oftentimes you'd be surprised, though. Uh, and and that's, that's the whole goal, is to avoid surprises in the process. Move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, and so the standard's been, been pushed back currently a year. Uh, I think there was a previous slide that, that had some dates. Um, those were the, the previous dates, but originally the standard effective for calendar year companies started in January 2020. So from a technical standpoint, years beginning after December 15th um, of 2019, it's been pushed back another year. And the FASB has made some, um, some concessions to private companies in terms of you know, interest rates to apply, discount rates to apply, and, and those types of things. And I'm going to guess there's going to be more that, that's going to come out of that um, as public companies finalize their, their adoption implementation. And the fact you can really understand the depth of, of work that's required and then the, analyze the benefit to, to investors and, and to users of the financial statements. But the, the takeaway from this is that the standard has been deferred for another year, and you have, you have time to, to kind of get your feet under you with this. I know the focus has been on revenue recognition. Um, but as you look at this, please, you know, reach out to us. Happy to help. Um, we have people that are really deep into the standard, understand it inside and out, and, and happy to happy to be a resource for you. The next thing I want to touch on is is the credit loss standard. And, and as I mentioned, this is the big one that's coming after lease. So the first was revenue recognition, and then um, and then lease standard. Scott touched on on the stock comp, um, but then the the credit loss standard is the one that's coming next, and it, it changes how companies have to recognize um, recognize anticipated credit losses from a current standpoint 
it's based on, on an incurred loss method methodology, meaning that the loss has to be probable, uh, and estimated before it's recognized uh, in, in the financial statements. It's moving to a, to a standard that has to, it's gonna use prospective, uh, prospective forecasts on, on what's out there, what's potentially out there. That's based on historical experience, current economic conditions, and then forward-looking statements that you can support. Um, and it, again, that, this is where there's gonna be a lot of judgment involved. Uh, it's going to take some work in getting your policies developed. Um, let's move to the next slide, please. Thank you. And it's going to cover really almost everything. Um, there are some exceptions to this, but from a typical balance sheet standpoint, you know, if, if you have loans to, that you issue to customers, you're in the scope of this. There's held a maturity debt securities. There's available for available. I'm sorry, available for sale in, um, investment securities as well. Um, trade receivable or accounts receivable. This is the one that's going to capture for a lot of companies. And then anything that relates to uh, repurchasing repurchase securities lending agreements, which most companies this probably isn't isn't a big deal. Um, but it's really the accounts receivable that it's going to trip up a lot of people. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And like I said, the good news is it's been, it's been pushed back years, so it was originally, originally going to be effective um, in 2021 for smaller reporting companies, uh, for private companies, 2022. And this has been pushed back for both groups to, to January 2023. And there's going to be a lot more that comes out on this over the coming weeks, uh, coming months, especially as we get closer probably towards the middle of next year as, as companies are really kind of digging into the lease standard and, and getting comfortable with that. And this is the next one that's out on the horizon. Let's move on to kind of the last last little section I want to touch on. Um, and it's, it's the private company relief for variable interest entities. Um, they have the option to not have to do this if they meet the, the, these criteria listed here. You know, it has to be a legal entity and reporting entity under common control. So you have one owner has two, two companies. There's not necessarily an interaction between the companies in terms of an ownership standpoint. They just have a common owner. Um, the reporting entity. The, the fourth bullet point here is, is the really the big one that's going to trip companies up or need to be aware of. Reporting companies cannot have a, a direct or indirect majority ownership um, in the legal entities' voting interest. Um, but if you don't, if you just have one owner, two companies, um, you don't have to consolidate that anymore as, as a variable interest entity, which is a, it's a big relief to companies um, versus the, the previous guidance that required pull these in and, and trying to explain the concept of a variable interest entity to investors to ownership to to bankers is oftentimes been a, been a challenge for companies let's launch the next slide um, and this is effective for Isaac, uh, january 20 yeah it's jen on that last slide there's the last point was reason for a change what is the reason for the change oh Thanks for thanks for touching on that. Um, it, it's really designed to improve information um, and the consistency of the information in the financial statements for users. There's been companies that have some have adopted, some have not adopted, some have, have disclosed certain things, others have disclosed other things based on how they're interpreting the standard. And it's really designed to to give the readers of the financial statements um, the information they need without muddying the waters and, and having things be be more comparable than they've previously been. And the last okay. is just you know it, it's going to be easier. You know it, it's going to reduce the cost. You're not going to have to, to spend as much time or resources analyzing relationships, analyzing uh, interests, back and forth between companies under common control. Um, it's, to make, it's just relief. It's to make things, things easier and faster. All right. It sounds like it's going to be more consistent more than anything. That's the goal. Yeah, absolutely. That's the goal. Um, it's going to be effective in calendar years uh, 2021, so years beginning after December 15th, uh, 2020. You can early adopt it. And at this point, you know, it's a relatively new standard, but I am having conversations with clients now about do we do we do this or not? Um, if you elect to do this, there is going to be an impact on your financial statements from deconsolidating uh, a previously consolidated variable interest entity. Uh, but it's something that that you have time to work through, and and we're happy to happy to help with that. So it will take time, but it's going to simplify. So that's why people would do it early, whereas usually when there's new stuff, you put it to the last second because it's a pain. But this sounds like Absolutely. it might be worth doing and spending the time on it because it's going to simplify things. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, and as you evaluate the standard, I would also 
really encourage you to talk to kind of your, your primary users of your financial statements. You know, is it a bank? And it, if it's your lenders, really kind of talk with them about the standard previously required us to include these entities. We're now allowed to, to not have to include this. Do you want to see this information? Does this impact your analysis of our company and our ability to repay loans we may have with you or our relationship? Um, if they come back and say yes, then we want to see it. You, may, you still may be stuck, right? You may, you may be forced to continue to consolidate it. But if they don't need that information, you know, it's an opportunity to, to not have to include that anymore. So the earlier you get out in front of this, I think the better. Um, but you do have some options here. Okay. Okay. And we are going to have our fifth and final polling question. <clears throat> So we are wanting to know what challenges are you facing related to your internal accounting team? Are you are you facing turnover, competency uh, gaps, a need for more training for your internal accounting team, uh, need to improve your technology, or none of the above? So we'd love to kind of have you just uh, let us know how your internal team is performing and or where they may need some assistance. And we've got uh, almost the whole group has voted here. Hold on just a, a moment, too. All right, we will go ahead and uh, close the poll and share the responses. Pretty, uh, pretty doesn't consistent. Get, I mean, pretty doesn't get much more even than that. Yeah, it? exactly, exactly. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, these are, I mean, I think these are challenges that all of our clients are facing, and. It's, uh, not not surprising uh, that uh, in some ways not 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 surprising that it's consistent in that way. So, yep. Great. Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes left on the webinar, and we're going to go through some questions that have been submitted. But if you have a question now, please go ahead and type it in. If we don't have time, our experts will get back to you afterwards. And I'm going to ask us to advance the slide so you can see their email addresses as well, in case you'd like to reach out directly. Um, but I think the first one's for you, Jen. It says, I, I have a question regarding 1099 drivers for a trucking company. Um, so can, can okay. you give some well, guidance on that? And then the, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, audience member also would love to talk to you later. But do you have a little bit of just overall guidance on that? That's, uh, there's no way I can answer that, that at the moment. As most people know, the Uber drivers out there in the world are part of a big class action lawsuit where they're disputing uber is disputing the ruling now uber is disputing it and saying that they are the seller of an app and that the drivers have nothing to do with them that's kind of a tall order other companies have been specifically ruled against i encourage you to look at the dynamax case which is from april of 2018 the Dynamex case in the California Superior Court specifically ruled that drivers had to be employees. So uh, it's it's going to be All very right, Jen, hard. You're, you're boring. You're boring me. You're boring me with your case law. Sorry. I think it sounds like you you should connect with this person. I mean, I think I think the reality is any you know sort of 1099 W2 issues are going to be very company by company, you know, specific and case by case specific. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I would say, yeah, you should definitely connect with that with with them, and uh, yeah, I know I know there's uh, we we work with um, a company Convoy who does a lot in the freight and like logistics and the the trucker kind of business, and so uh, it's an it's a very interesting space for sure. Yes, yeah. and here is uh, here is a another very straightforward question though I think that Jen can get in the last minute here. Do we have to issue 1099s to lawyers, accountants, and other professionals that we did business with during the year? Yes, if they're not incorporated and they're an LLC or an LP, you are technically supposed to issue them a 1099. Okay. All right, well, we are running out of time, but we really do appreciate everyone logging in. Uh, again, this is the contact information for our presenters. Feel free to reach out to them directly. And I do want to let you know that you will receive a copy of the slide deck um, within 48 hours. You're also going to receive a survey. And if you would like that uh, C CPE credit, you're going to need to fill out that uh, survey in order to, to finalize the process. So thank you to our presenters. And thank you for joining us on this webinar today.